Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of 1 Samuel 15, and I will be reading verses 10 through 23 from the New International Version of the Bible. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and cried out to the Lord all night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul. When Saul, Samuel reached him, he said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said to Saul, No, you haven't. What is the bleeding of sheep I hear in my ears? What is the lowing of the cattle that I hear? Saul replied, Well, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord, but we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. You did not do as the Lord commanded. Let me tell you what God has told me. Although you were once small in your own eyes, you became the head of all of the tribes of Israel. The Lord anointed you king over Israel and sent you on a mission to go and defeat the Amalekites. Why do you not obey the Lord? Why do you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of God? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. And, well, I mostly destroyed the Amalekites. I brought back Agag the king. The soldiers took the sheep and the cattle, though, for the plunder. They took them. And, well, we devoted the animals to God. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Or does the Lord delight more in obedience to the Lord. To obey is better than any sacrifice. Because you objected, you have rejected the word of God. He has rejected you as the king. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this morning, I am so excited because we are beginning our new summer series. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Spiritual Wisdom from Fred Rogers. Now, I want to thank Antonia Craighill for um, the altar and the red sweater, the shoes, the rocking chair, all kinds of wonderful um, Mr. Rogers neighborhood things. Mr. Rogers was an iconic father figure to me and to many who were children raised between 1968 and 2001 which is when Mr. Rogers' program was on PBS. So if you had a child or were raising a child or a grandchild during that time, you probably watched many episodes too. Fred Rogers has been the subject of many books, movies, and documentaries. Most recently, Fred Rogers was portrayed by Tom Hanks in the 2019 film, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it but make sure you watch it with Kleenex. In addition to being a beloved children's television star, Mr. Rogers was an ordained Presbyterian pastor. The television executives on his show never allowed Fred to mention God, but even though he didn't explicitly say anything about Jesus on the show, he exuded the gospel everywhere he went. He spread the love of God with his actions and with his presence. So, for the next seven weeks of the summer, I am delighted that we will be diving in to the ministry and the spiritual wisdom of Fred Rogers and explore all he taught the world. And out of all of the wonderful qualities that I believe Fred exuded, one of the most remarkable was his ability to engage in vulnerability. He modeled vulnerability on and off screen with both adults and children. And he showed others that vulnerability attracts vulnerability. He would open up on his show, in the living room, in interviews, about real topics like racism, violence, 
And he would share earnestly from his heart, giving countless individuals the freedom to embrace their real thoughts and feelings. I was watching clips of Mr. Rogers this week preparing for this, and I loved how the, you could literally watch the children just soak up everything he was saying on his show, especially when he validated their feelings. Because not everybody gets that. And as soon as they were validated, they just expressed so much love for him. So vulnerability is something that Fred Rogers embraced. But if we're honest in our culture, it's something many of us try to avoid. We don't like it. It's scary. But this morning I'm hoping that we will remember that we will never grow in, in, as individuals if we do not embrace vulnerability. We are all created in the image of God to know and be known. And the truth is you can't cultivate that intimacy and that connection without being vulnerable. We were made for it. So if vulnerability allows us to experience truth and freedom and ultimately that connection that we were made for, why do we fight it so often? And why does our culture fight it? I think the number one reason is because most of us believe the myth that vulnerability is weakness. That perception is not only the most widely accepted myth, but it is also something that is so dangerous when we live it out. Both men and women struggle with the ability to be truly vulnerable, but our society has most drastically attacked the men in our culture about this, which is why I feel like it is so important to talk about vulnerability on Father's Day. Because the strong men of God in our congregation deserve to be encouraged and affirmed for who they are, vulnerability and all. They need to know that they are brave when they are sharing their hearts with us, just as much as they are brave when they are killing spiders for us. They need to know they are strong when they admit that they were wrong and messed up just as much as they are strong when they are carrying those heavy boxes up the stairs. Men should be celebrated when vulnerable, but we have not done a good job of that in our culture. Hollywood gives men characters like John Wayne, Sean Connery, Charlton Heston, and Clint Eastwood. These men can be stoic at times, both off and on the movie screen, but stoicism is exhausting. And repressing vulnerability all the time is unhealthy, which is why I love another man that we are highlighting, Mr. Rogers, who would often just be real. And he embraced his quirks all in all. He knew people thought there were things that he did that was weird, but he didn't care. He was authentic. The Bible gives us lots of examples of both men and women who lived and led with vulnerability. But I want to look at two famous men in the Old Testament and see how they fared in this. The first man is King Saul. Saul was Israel's first king. The prophet Samuel anointed Saul when he was 30 years old, and Saul reigned over Israel for 42 years. Saul was handsome, tall, physically strong, and a great military leader. Samuel would receive a word from the Lord, and Samuel would give that word to Saul. And through Saul's leadership, Israel was victorious in everything they fought for, for a while. You see, Saul had many strengths, but vulnerability was not one of them. He refused to engage in vulnerability. There were many times in the book of 1 Samuel where Saul would directly disobey the Lord, Samuel would call him out on it, and after every time Saul would screw up, he would blame everyone else around him. He loved to make excuses for doing what he did, and he didn't like taking any responsibility for his mistakes. He 
would give, he would get instructions from Samuel, instructions from the Lord, and then he would do what Saul wanted to do, which I guess a lot of us tend to do. When he was supposed to wait for Samuel before making an offering to the Lord, he impatiently went ahead and did it himself. When he was told not to keep any of the Amalekite animals after the war with them, he went behind the Lord's back and kept some of the animals anyway. And to make matters worse, when Saul finally did repent, he only used it as a manipulation tactic to minimize the consequences of his disobedience. Saul's repentance was never authentic because there was no change in his behavior. There was no fruit. He immediately would say, oh, I'm sorry, and then go off and do something wrong again, blaming everyone else. And every chapter of Saul's misadventures include him being angry. Saul was an angry dude. The problem with anger, though, is that it's a secondary emotion that covers up pain and sadness, primary emotions. We can never properly process and heal when we mask our feelings with anger. The issue that Saul was, the issue with Saul was not his shortcomings, but it was what he did about his shortcomings that made him a weak leader and a difficult man to follow. So the throne was taken from him after his 42nd year of reigning, and Samuel informed Saul that another king would take his place, and that man was King David. David was also handsome with red hair. He was physically strong, a hard worker, and a great shepherd. He later on went to be a good military leader too, and he became king when Samuel anointed him at 30 years old, just like Saul. And David reigned for 40 years. And through David, David went down in history as a man after God's own heart. And I think I remember reading this in Sunday school. We actually just did this craft in Sunday school last week, thinking, oh, well, if he was a man after God's own heart, he was perfect. That's not true. He messed up a lot. He, like, majorly messed up a lot. But when he messed up, it was very different than what Saul did. One particular story. When David's men were off fighting a battle for him, David started looking at one of his most trusted advisors' wives. Her name was Bathsheba. And David let his lustful thoughts for her take over, and he ended up forcing himself on her, sending her back to her husband's house like nothing had happened. But word was sent back to David a few months later that Bathsheba had gotten pregnant from the assault. So David decides to take matters into his own hands, and he has his friend Uriah, which is Bathsheba's husband, murdered on the battlefield to make it look like an accident. The Bible is kind of just like a soap opera. When David was rebuked by his mentor Nathan, who knew everything that had happened, he repented immediately. And we see this in the Psalms. Now, most of you know King David wrote the majority of the Psalms, but Psalm 32 gives us some very powerful insight into David's heart during this time, knowing what he had done, violence against his best friend and violence against his best friend's wife. The New Living Translation of Psalm 32 says, when I keep silent about my sin, my body wastes away and I groan all day long. We see how the repression of not being honest about David's actions was killing him inside. He was not opening up. He was keeping this major secret inside until Nathan confronted him, and it was destroying him. But after the confrontation, David gives a straightforward and wholehearted confession 
While Saul's confessions were usually long explanations of manipulations and blaming others, David takes full responsibility for his major mistakes, understands that he sinned against God and the people in his community, and he took his actions and the consequences of those actions very seriously. He grieved, he wept, and he cried out to the Lord. David was a strong, brave man after God's own heart, and he showed his emotions, allowing himself to truly process and heal. Now, there were consequences of what happened, but God continued to use David and bless him Just like God continues to use us and bless us when we make big mistakes, but come to him in earnest contrition. David continued to lead and live as a man who loved God and loved others. And he was a man who was truly authentic. Now, what about us? What does vulnerability look like for us today? Vulnerability is not just taking responsibility for our sins and confessing our shortfalls like it was in this story. It's not just crying or sharing our emotions. It is those things, but it's so much more. Vulnerability is telling someone you love them first, not knowing if they'll say it back. It's calling up a friend who's just lost a loved one and saying that you will be there for them in their grief. It's admitting any time when we need help, when we've never asked for help before. It's starting a new career or it's starting a new project in retirement. It's signing a parent up for hospice care. It's waiting for medical test results to come back. It's walking into a church where you don't know anyone. And it might even be going to a dance class and trying to learn how to tango. Vulnerability comes in many ways. And none of the examples of vulnerability I listed has anything to do with weakness. It takes great courage to step up to the plate after striking out or after being terrified you're going to strike out. Mr. Rogers used to say on his show, the greatest gift you can ever give someone is your true, honest self. And I love that because there's nothing better than being authentic with God and being authentic with the people in our lives. Loved ones, vulnerability is how we grow, how we flourish, and how we better ourselves. And it all starts with courage to lean in. So men of God in this room, we confess that we have not given your space to be your wholehearted selves. We're sorry for the times that we have made you feel like you had to keep it all together and be strong for us. We apologize when we weren't a safe place to allow you to process and heal. And we affirm all of your feelings, not just the chuck ones where we kick down doors and take names. We pray that through vulnerability, you would experience belonging, joy, and courage. And to the women of God in this room, let us celebrate all of the fathers, grandfathers, husbands, sons, cousins, uncles, and friends in our lives, and the multifaceted, beautiful complexity that they are. Culture has lied to us for so long, telling us that to be vulnerable is to be weak. So, this summer, let us erase that. Let us embrace the uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure that comes with vulnerability, knowing that on the other side of that comes freedom, courage, and strength. Amen. Amen. All right, at this time...